Hello everyone, welcome to The Differential. Today, I have a special guest joining me. I've got the one and only Lady Beard. This is Lady Beard coming to you all the way from Tokyo, Japan. I'm thrilled to be here. Go around, my friend. Good to see you, sir. How are you? I'm doing so well. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me, man. I'm thrilled to be here. Now, listen, listen, for everybody watching, I know you're all uh, massive Gorab fans, and you see the man as he appears on the screen. You see the man presented. Let me tell you, in organizing this, uh, Gorab has been one of the most polite and professional people that I've ever dealt with. So uh, future people that employ doctors, hey! Hey, Gorab is your guy. If you need a polite professional, this man has got you covered. That means a lot. Hey, you're going to be one of my uh, letters of recommendation in the future. I can already yes. see it. <laughs> yes. Lady Beard knows everything about medicine. Yes. I will recommend doctors. That's what I do now. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Lady Beard, can you just give a little bit of information about yourself? Yeah. Hello. Lovely to meet you. My name's Lady Beard. I am originally from Australia, but I now live in Tokyo, Japan, where I am a cross-dressing pro wrestler and heavy metal singer. My new group, Baby Beard, just released its debut single, Nippo Gara Konnichiwa! And we'll talk about that later. <laughs> well, that's a great intro right there. So, like you mentioned, you're originally from Australia. Why'd you yeah. leave? So here's the story in a nutshell. I um I I uh, started out as an actor. I went through acting school in Australia. I then I trained in stunts as well. And my stunt trainer said you should go to Hong Kong. So I went to Hong Kong and I was a stunt man and an actor and a voice actor in Hong Kong. Then that 2008 financial crisis came along and wiped that career out. And so I said I suddenly found myself unemployed on the other side of the world. And I said, hey. I've got an idea about how to solve all my problems. I'll become a cross-dressing pro wrestler and heavy metal singer. And so I did that. And then I toured to Japan and it went great. And so then I moved to Japan and then I got famous. Oh yeah, that's you know a normal story right there. That's, that's exactly how it goes. How it goes. <laughs> so you said that you also did some wrestling, right? That's right, pro wrestler, yeah. So what got you into pro wrestling? Uh, so, I, like, so I was a martial artist uh, for many, many years. Started martial arts when I was you know a teenager. And so then that's how I could train through all my education. That's how I could then become a stunt person because I trained in the uh, kind of the, the Jackie Chan school of sort of cinematic action, right? That was my, my trainer in Australia. He was former Jackie Chan stunt team. So I trained in that style. And then I was in Hong Kong doing kind of that kind of style and so forth in TV and movies and whatnot. Um, and then now, look, I was always interested in pro wrestling because really when you think about it, it's a combination of all the things I do already, isn't it? So, you know, character performance and, you know, stunts and fight performance. It's, a, you know, it's those things in a beautiful theatrical little package, isn't it? Um, but in my hometown in Australia, it wasn't really accessible for me. There were wrestling gyms, but they were all on the other side of town. I couldn't really get to them and this kind of thing. When I got to Hong Kong, that was the first time I ever found wrestling accessible because it turned out the, uh, they had a pro wrestling federation and uh, I could access it. And so I started training there because of my stunt background. I picked, I picked up the physical side of things relatively quickly. And um, that's how that happened. Do you still wrestle? Yep, still wrestle. I have not wrestled very much since the start of the pandemic because, you know, in times of pandemic, being up close and huffy puffy with another human is not ideal. But yeah, no, I do still wrestle. So when did you start cross-dressing? Uh, so what happened was when I was 14 years old, a friend of mine had a school uniform party and I decided to wear my big sister's school dress to this school uniform party. And it was hilarious for everyone involved. So from that point on, I became a casual cross-dresser and I would wear this school dress to rock and roll shows and parties and things like this. Um, and so then when I started wrestling, it was very interesting. When I started wrestling, it was, I was getting ready for my first match and I was asked, all right, so what do you want your in-ring gimmick to be? And I said, uh, I am going to put on a dress and I'm going to be called Ladybeard. And the other wrestlers all went, uh, okay. Because all of them, their gimmick was, I am a wrestler. And that's what, that's all they had. So, so I went into the ring and I was um, the only wrestler in the organization that really had a gimmick. And so therefore I stood out and overnight I was the most popular wrestler in Hong Kong. Okay. So have you felt any pushback cross-dressing? 
Um, yeah, so this is interesting, actually. So when I started, it was in the 90s and it was in Australia. And, um, you know, we had not gone through the transgender rights movement that we've recently had. So, yeah, when I started, there was a lot of pushback when I started um, going outside the house in a dress was a, a dangerous activity. Um, I think had I not been a martial artist, I probably would not have felt safe and confident enough to do it. Uh, but I was, and so I did. Hmm. Um, yeah, no, I felt, yeah, quite a lot of pushback. It's becoming less and less, though. And um, also, once I got to Asia, it was sort of a different thing in Asia. Because I was a foreigner doing it, it became a different thing, sort of. I, uh, I cut my thumb. That's why I have a Band-Aid on my thumb. As you can see, I cut my thumb uh, in the kitchen whilst I was um, cutting my chicken. Ooh. That's not related to the interview at all. I just thought I'd mention it since you saw my thumb. I thought, oh, well, now the cat's out of the bag. Now my thumb's on camera. Now I need to mention the thumb in question. Yeah, people need to know what, what you've been doing. That's so dangerous. <laughs> you know what? You would think that the Band-Aid on the pro wrestler's thumb would be from something else, but it wasn't. It was from making a mistake whilst cooking my chicken. Uh, I would show, I don't think you'd be able to see on my thumb, but I've cut, I think, both of my thumbs three times to four times each with a knife. Oh, uh, no. I've got a big slit just down the middle. I've cut off a section off the side. I was a very, oh, wow. uh, very dumb kid. <laughs> oh, you're like a human sushi chef. You just like, ah, everybody <laughs> sushi. Hey. The, the longest cut I have, I, I literally was just like, I don't, I was cutting something. I'm like, it's not working. And I'm like, this knife isn't sharp. So I just start rubbing it to see, is it, is it sharp? And it's like, oh, oh. I see. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I wasn't a very smart kid, um, but hey, I'm a well, medical student now, so. <laughs> I was gonna say, look, <laughs> you're in the smartest position a person your age can possibly be in. So clearly it did have a very negative effect. True, true. So <laughs> what led you to Japan? I right, so I started my career. Okay, so, so, so I was in Hong Kong, living in Hong Kong, uh, start man and so forth. Financial crisis turns up, wipes out that career. I start my career as Lady Beard, start uh, pro wrestling, start my music career as Lady Beard. And uh, what happened was I then did a tour to Japan. So in 2011, I organized myself a tour, came to Japan, did a series of shows. It went great. And I said, okay, so I need to move there. So I uh, you know, went back and I got myself organized, went back to Australia for a bit, got myself organized, then I moved over to, over to Japan in 2013. And uh, then I met my first manager who also, uh, the reason I met her was she was a professional photographer and she specialized in photographing cross dresses. So she took my photo and we put it up on the internet and it went viral. And that's how I became a famous person in Japan. Yeah, you just gotta go viral, that's it. <laughs> Gonna go viral, that's, hey, listen, we're in the 21st century, people. The 21st century, going viral is the way to attain fame. You already know that, because you were clicking away on your TikToks whilst I was drinking from a straw. You young'uns, you know exactly how to go viral nowadays. Drinking from a straw won't get you there. Tie a pity tight with a non-injured thumb on TikTok. That is the way to go viral, my friends. Get on it. Man, you're, you're making yourself sound a little old there. You know, you young'uns, I mean, Look, I'm just a man with an injured thumb. Look, there's only so much typing that's possible when one thumb is extremely sensitive due to a chicken-related injury. So I'll just be a thumbs up for the rest of the interview. <laughs> yeah, it, hey, that also reminds me, uh, everyone who's watching, make sure you give this video a like, you know, show some yes. love. And a comment and a subscribe. And don't forget to check out my new group, Baby Beard. And now we haven't even made it to this part of the interview yet. I'll get, keep going. No, but you, hey, he's he's building that anticipation. So, you know. I am. I uh, so made it yet. Do you like living in Japan? Uh, yeah, it's great. It's hilarious. <laughs> it's a daily adventure. It's a daily adventure. Now, you yourself have been to Japan, Gorab, yeah? Yeah, I study abroad back in undergrad for only two and a half weeks, though. <laughs> Two and a half weeks. Oh, okay. I was under the impression you did like a like a two month kind of stint here. I wish. Uh, two and a half. Hang on. So you came to Japan to study for two weeks. Yeah. <laughs> I would imagine you would not get very much learnt in two weeks. Uh, <laughs> interesting story. So in my undergrad, uh, for the degree I was going in, I was in the honors program, and in the honors program, there's this requirement that you have to study abroad for nine credit hours. Um, I didn't realize. That it was nine credit hours i thought it was just 
study abroad. So okay. I was like, all right, where can I study abroad? I've always wanted to go to Japan, found a program oh, in Japan. Sweet. And I was like, this is great. It has nothing to do with my major because I was a biochem major, but this was a plant science cl class, so no correlation there. Um, but it was, wow. yeah, it was great. Wait, hang <laughs> on just a second now. You're a med student. Your major was in what, biomed? Biochemistry. Biochemistry. You had to go overseas for nine hours, which seems to me like a very odd amount of time which you must study in a foreign country for nine hours for nine hours people you must study in a different country so you come to japan and learn plant science i fail to understand how this is applicable to your medicine degree i, I will admit uh, i think there's a big confusion there it's actually nine credit hours so that's more than nine hours necessarily it's uh what that represents is supposed to be like nine hours of in class per week i think something like that you university students just changing the english language and hours not an hour anymore a ultimatum is a place where you live on a campus oh, i don't know what university people are talking about anymore uh, I tell you, I have an injured thumb. That's my contribution to this conversation. I injured this finger as well. Interesting. They have two band aids. There's two of them. They're friends. Anyway, um, yeah, Japan's great. <laughs> <laughs> We're off the topic there. I'll drink for a straw again. Just a minute. You know, with all those injured fingers, you should really come see this medical student in the U.S. Maybe, uh Of course, I should. All my injuries, Gorev can take care of these. Hey, if you need a doctor. If you need a doctor, you need to hit up Gorev, the differential doctor. Ladybeard gives Gorev one thumbs up, <laughs> as can be seen by this amazing video we're currently filming. So, do you still feel like a foreigner in Japan, or do you feel like... Yes. Are you, you do? 100%. Um, so, Japan's wonderful. Uh, however, Japan is very much its own thing, and the Japanese have their own systems and their own way of doing absolutely everything and uh i what i'm about to say now is just how i feel from being here because i'm not japanese so i'll never really understand if you're not japanese you'll never really understand no matter how long you stay here but i feel that the japanese systems and the japanese processes and the japanese way of doing things are integral to the japanese sense of identity would that be accurate japanese manager Okay, somewhat agrees. And so, therefore, you, things must be done according to these very specific systems, which are different from everybody else's systems. So, therefore, as a foreigner, you ask, why are we doing these systems? But the word why really probably should not be applied. The answer is because that's the way Japan does it, and that's the way Japan's always done it. That's the way Japan always will do it. So deal with it. So to that end, you can never get it. Because if you're not Japanese, you didn't grow up here, you didn't go through the educational system and have a Japanese family and so forth, you just will never get it. Um, and so therefore, yeah, you just, you kind of go, oh, okay. And you learn that that is the system and that is the system that you must follow, but yeah, you do it. And that's kind of where it ends. You never really get your head around why this is the system. Well, you know, is this is the system and we must follow it. Is that uh, an accurate description of Japan, Japanese manager? Uh, sort of. From a foreigner's perspective? <laughs> sort of. Sort of is the answer coming back from my Japanese manager. Which highlights my point that as a foreigner, you'll never get it. Perfectly highlights my point. Thank you for illustrating my point. <laughs> It's funny that you mentioned that though, because um, when I was in middle school, one of my history professors, he was Native American, um, he said that he had lived in Japan for, I wanna say about a year or so. And he said that even though he had lived there for a while now and his neighbors, you know, they, they treated him like, you know, he was from Japan. At the same time, he didn't really feel like he was, he still felt like a foreigner, no matter what he did or how long he was there for. So I can see your point on that for sure you never you yeah you'll always be foreign and you know it's not good it's not bad that's just how it is yeah, yeah. 
I mean, and it's funny that you mentioned identity too, because I feel like even for me, just being in the US, even though I was born in America, it's something about like the identity of it. It's like, yeah, I always wanted to be considered American, but then it's like, once I got older, it's kind of like I wanted to identify myself more with the fact that I'm Indian. And so, mm. you know, it, I kind of felt that as well. And growing up, that was a really big value that I went for, especially in undergrad. Um, that's when it really hit me. And even now uh, that I'm in medical school, it's kind of like my identity. It's like, what is it really? And do I fit into what Americans consider their identity? And I still don't feel like personally, even though I was born in America, I've never really felt like I'm really American, just the way that some people treat me and how others do, you know, it's just, it's kind of interesting. But so, okay, so when you're, have you been, have you spent time in India? Uh, I have, I'm trying to think how long it was. I've only been once for my uncle's wedding, probably, okay. I think it was two, two weeks. Okay. So when you're, okay, so two weeks and so not a substantial amount of time, but when you're with the family, are they kind of more, pardon me for using, I guess, um, I guess for a rambunctious vocabulary, but are they, are they kind of more Indian than you? Do they? Yeah. Behave more Indian ish than you do? It's interesting. So when I was there, the first thing that like every, and you know, my family spread all throughout India. So I'd see some for like maybe half a day and we would travel and see another. And every single one of them is just like, first thing they'll do is they'll say, speak in English and just say like how excited they are to meet me and everything. And they were trying to, I feel like, be more American than Indian when uh, they were seeing me, which I thought was interesting. Um, but at the same time, yeah, I definitely, I don't know. I felt like I didn't feel different than them. It's weird. Like, I guess when I went to India, cause this was like near end of high school, actually it was like right at the end of high school. That's when I was like, wow, this is like, I'm actually, I don't feel that different than like, you know, when you watch Indians and American TV shows, it's so stereotypical. I mean, now it's getting better, but it's been so stereotypical. I'm like, oh, this is what's going to be like when I was in India. But it was really interesting. It was more, it's really hard to describe. It just felt natural being there. Um, okay. but yeah, it's, I, I wouldn't say that they were more Indian necessarily, or they didn't feel like they were more Indian. It just, I mean, obviously they were, they could speak Hindi. I can't speak Hindi. I could understand. Some of it. Hindi, okay. Yeah. I could only right. understand it. Um, it led to some interesting conversations because a lot of my family there, uh, could speak English, but then the ones who couldn't, they could understand it. So they would be speaking to me in Hindi. I'd be speaking in English and we both could understand each other, but it was just, it was so strange of a conversation. Wow. That, that ends up happening when you start working cross-culturally. Yeah, I totally understand. Um, right, so did you feel in India, did you feel that the average person on the street treated you like a foreigner or just treated you like one of, one of the gang? I think before they realized I was American, they would treat me like just any other Indian. It was when I only spoke in English and like perfect English that like depending <laughs> on where I was. So like if I was in a store, then it, you know, it makes a difference because um, in certain stores and more so like outside of stores where they have stalls and stuff, um, you know, you can negotiate prices. So then it kind of, you know, it makes a difference. So my mom or dad would be like, hey, don't say anything. Just point out what you want and I'll go do the talking. So that way oh, really? it doesn't ruin the oh. negotiation, you know, because they, they were born and raised in India. So like they still have the accent and everything. They can they can make sure we get I, a Indian price rather than like a foreigner price. Yeah, I see. So I asked this because I was gonna apply your experience to Japan somehow, but I'll be honest, I've forgotten what I was thinking when I actually brought it back to your Indian heritage. My apologies. Japan's hilarious, but yeah, I have always felt like a foreigner and I feel I always will. Um, you know, I have very close friends here who are Americans who have lived here for 20 plus years and they're still yeah, perfect Japanese, reading, writing, all of it, studied Japanese in university and they still don't get it. And it's just how it is. You know? Right. So um, you... even, sorry, sorry to interrupt. No, yeah. Even if you're like American born Japanese or if you're half Japanese or something like that, you come back and um, you're still foreign. One of my best friends here is American born Japanese. And the first time I met his extended family, like his wife's family, the first thing his sister-in-law says to me is, he is like a foreigner. And I'm like, all right, <laughs> all right. I also am like a foreigner because I am a foreigner. So, so I think it's even for him, right? Like he tells me that even he kind of sometimes, you know, he's hundred percent Japanese and he's American. And sometimes he does things and he'll be like, oh yeah, because I said the wrong thing because I thought like an American for a second. And so, you know, 
So it's a, it's a unique and it's a specific place and a specific culture. And um, it's a hilarious adventure. I recommend anyone who gets the opportunity to come to Japan should come to Japan and have a hilarious time. And then you should go check out my new band, Baby Beard. Oh, baby Beard! And our new song, Nippogara Konnichiwa! We haven't even gotten there yet. I'm sorry. Let's bring it back to the interview. Don't worry. We're about to get there, though. Oh, we're getting there. Yeah, getting there, people. Excellent. So do you feel like you're more recognized within Japan or outside of Japan? Uh, um, one of the joys of doing this is if I, uh, okay, inside Japan, if I'm in costume, if I walk the streets in costume, everyone's like, oh, it's Lady Beard, oh, we were just, before this, we were just out on the street doing an interview, and people walking past, oh, Biotan, that's my Japanese nickname, Biotan, oh, Biotan, oh, right, people hit me with this, right, um, but what's interesting, however, though, is if I, you know, put my hair down and just, you know, put on a shirt. I look like all the other foreigners. So people just kind of walk past me. But then if I go to, if I go overseas, then people just off the face will be like, aren't you the beard, skirt, mustache man? So it's interesting. If I'm in costume, more recognized in Japan. If I'm not in costume, more recognized overseas. Ah, that, that is interesting. It is interesting actually, yeah. There's a lot of foreigners in Japan with beards and long hair. It was interesting because when I lived in Hong Kong, most of the foreigners there are like working in the bank and whatnot. So they're clean cut and they have short hair and suits and whatnot. So therefore I stood out as like a sore thumb because I've got a heavy metal thug, right? But here in Japan, a lot of the foreigners look like heavy metal thugs. Tokyo is like, it's like, it's like a world magnet for freaks. Everyone who was a freak at home gets drawn to Tokyo because they visit for the first time, specifically Tokyo, not, not Japan, Tokyo, because they visit for the first time and they're like, oh, I found my people. So then everyone gets drawn to, to Tokyo. So there's a whole lot of um, heavy metal thug looking foreigners walking around. So therefore I just blend right in. That's interesting because I was only in Tokyo for, I think, it was two and a half days, um, but because during my trip, it was we go to different cities every two to three days. So um, Tokyo was the one place where I actually did notice there was more foreigners there. And the way you kind of described it too, it's kind of like that's where you would see them. It was like when I got by the time I got to Osaka, it was it was not like that at all. <laughs> oh no! When you get into the countryside, it's either tourists or uh, very conservative foreigners who are working there in tourism or English teaching or things like that. You know, it's wonderful actually when you get to the countryside in Japan because, you know, Tokyo is a big, big city. So the people are big city people. As soon as you get into the country, pretty much anywhere, people are very, very friendly and very, very warm. And they're all like, oh, what are you doing here? And they want to have the conversation. So in general, would you recommend people more so visit Japan as like a tourist or kind of stay for Maybe, you know, how some people come to teach English, maybe for like a year or two. Which one do you think, um, do you think would be better? I know it's kind of hard to compare since you haven't actually done like the uh, teaching English, but. I was going to say, do whatever the hell you want to do. Whatever the hell will make you happy. That's Lady Beard's recommendation. Just don't cut your thumb cooking chicken whilst you do it. Do whatever the hell you want, minus thumb injuries. Um, the old, the homestay or the English teach is a, uh, a great option, I think, because just for tourism, I mean, you know, you need a decent chunk of cash saved up to just go be a tourist. Whereas if you turn up and you do, you know, a lot of people have the option of the language school or the, the working holiday, which is wonderful if you can get that visa or the homestay or, you know, the English teaching as well. That way you've got a job and you kind of arrive with a community of people around you and a support network and structure, you know? So therefore, yeah. But you know, if you turn up as a tourist and just show up, you know, and have a great time for two weeks, you'll have a great time doing that as well. I, I will say my two weeks was not long enough. Uh, as soon as the two weeks ended, I was like, oh my gosh, I need to like get back here ASAP. It's just expensive well, to get back. Spending, you were spending nine credit hours learning about plant biology that's why you are not out and about seeing the sights of japan my friend you were in a building being taught about plant security i can't even say the name of the course properly anymore what is a plant what plant, plant biodiversity? <laughs> what? mad science plant science plant science this was your problem hey <laughs> lady beer's recommendation is not coming to japan to study plant science unless Unless you need nine credit hours for your degree, in which case it's a great option. 
I will admit though, um, for my at least study abroad, even though it was supposed to be more so like the traditional you're studying, our the teacher that I went with, shout out to him, uh, he was so great. He made sure to give us a lot of free time, especially when we got to uh, Kyoto. He gave us, I think it was like two or three full free days, which out of two and a half weeks is, you know, quite a bit. And um, some people went to Universal Studios in Osaka. I personally wanted to do stuff that was more like Japanese, I guess. I went I went to like the bamboo forest and, you know, okay. I, it was great. Like every single thing I did there, I felt like was so meaningful and I just enjoyed it so much that it's like, ah, it just makes me want to go back so much. <laughs> That's wonderful, man. Everything you did here was so meaningful and you enjoyed it so much. That is a beautiful sentence. Wow, we should, you should put that on a Japan tourism board. That's fantastic. That's wonderful. Um, Kyoto is beautiful. Did you go to the big golden palace thing? Yeah, that was our very first day uh, we went there. It was funny. We and um, you're probably going to see this in the future, too, if uh, you check out my reaction. But um, there was one of our classmates who stopped by one of the souvenir shops there and he was looking through the shirts and one of them, he was like, hey, look, I found an Adidas shirt. It's only five bucks, but it was misspelled. And it was just hilarious. I'm not going to say what it said just because it's not. A uh, or something like that. Huh? A memus or something like that. Uh, sure. Let's go with that. It was it was yeah, missing okay. a couple letters, a little rearranged, but um, it was just funny because, you know, it's kind of similar in America, you know, where people get tattoos in like Chinese or Japanese and don't know what it says. But it's kind of like for the aesthetic of it, you know, it just. It was just funny to see that also happening in Japan, but more so with English, so. <laughs> yeah, that happens. It's good. You can find some, some t-shirt gold in Japan. There's plenty of that. For sure. Yeah. So I think it's time we talk about your music a bit. Oh my God! Here we are, ladies and gentlemen. We have made it. We have made it to the end of nine credit hours of plant science. The time has come to discuss Lady Beard's brand new pop metal group, Baby Beard. Let me explain. For those of you who don't understand, like I said before, I'm a pro wrestler and also a heavy metal singer. And so I recently started a brand new pop metal group called Baby Beard. It is Lady Beard plus two adorable little Japanese girls singing and dancing. Well, I mainly scream and dance. The girls sing and dance. They have angelic, beautiful voices and they are adorable little Japanese girls. Clearly, I am as angelic as the specimen that sits before you now, except my vocals are mainly comprised of <laughs> type vocals, but also a lot of cute dancing. So baby beard, that's babies, plus lady beard equals baby beard. Now, what you need to do is head on down to social media and type in baby beard underscore Japan. That's baby beard underscore Japan. Take those non-injured thumbs of yours and type that into your telephonical device. Baby beard underscore Japan on the Twitter, the Facebooky, the Instagrammy, the Tiki Toki, the YouTube, and probably whatever other ones have been invented by the time you see this interview. Hey, hey! You need to go and press follow, you need to go and press like, and most importantly, our debut music video, Nippon Kara Konnichiwa, is coming out on January 24! By the time you see this, it'll be later than January 24, which means you can go down to the YouTubes right now and search Baby Beard, Nippon Kara Konnichiwa, and you'll be able to see our brand new music video. In fact, Gora, you saw the music video, you made a reaction to it. What do you think? I honestly thought it was such a creative music video. So I had three guests join me. Uh, I reacted to it twice, actually, uh, within the oh, same day. So I had um, one of my classmates, Aaliyah, and another classmate, Honey, both medical students as well. Shout out to them. Um, they both checked it out with me. And I am a little bit more familiar with you um, just because of my friend group. Some of them had mentioned you before. I'm pretty sure um, I'd seen some videos of you before as well, back when I was an undergrad. And so when I saw this music video, I was like, wow, this is great. The music is, I don't know. It's something about it, it like brings energy, but also is just like, it reminds me of an anime opener, if anything. Oh, awesome. <laughs> yes, I like that answer, good, yes. <laughs> I don't know, it's like something about it. It was like, I even told one of my friends, I was like, you know, next time I have one of my shelf exams, a uh, shelf exam is one of our more important exams in order to pretty much keep making it our way through to, um, to getting our degree. And I just took one literally the day before 
uh, watching your music video. I was like, oh my gosh, if I'd seen this before going into that exam, I would have been so high. I would have been so ready for this exam. I would have aced it. Cause like going into, I was like a nervous track. And I was like, if I'd heard this, I would have, all the nerves would have been gone. It would have been great. <laughs> That's what we're all about, baby beard. We are, we're all about studying. We're getting people unnervous for their shelf exams. That's what we're all about. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's quite a unique uh, style of music. If you've heard baby metal, imagine that, except in the center, instead of having the, uh, the young lady that you have in baby metal, you have a giant um, cross-dressing, screaming, dancing, a bearded Aussie. That's what baby beard is really. You can head down to YouTube and you can search Baby Beard Nippon Kara Konnichiwa and watch the music video right now. You can put us on pause, watch the music video, come back and prepare yourself for more hilarious commentary. In fact, don't just watch it once, watch it twice, three times, five times with an injured thumb, with an uninjured thumb, with an injured forefinger. You can watch it as many times as you like, but then come back and continue watching this interview. Also with that, make sure you share it to all your friends and family because yes. you know everyone's going to love seeing it. Yes, smashing like, smashing subscribe, smashing share, all the smashing, smash all the things, smash, 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 smush, smash, 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 smush. Or it's starting smush. to lose some meaning to you, right? <laughs> oh, listen, I don't even know where I am anymore. I woke up here on this desk, I was like, oh, what's going on? I was gonna drink this with a straw. In fact, for those Don't of you who are watching, make sure you actually do pause and go watch it real quick if you haven't, because I think for the rest of this interview, it'll make a lot more sense if you've seen the music video, as well as it'll ruin some spoilers that we might be talking about. So definitely pause That's and right. go watch real quick. <laughs> And don't forget the differential doctor's reaction to Nippon Kara Konnichiwa by Baby Beard. Now, since I don't have the thing, I don't know that video is online. It can't be online now, but when you see this, will it be online? I don't even know. I don't know where I am. I'm going to drink with a straw, but you should watch Gorav's reaction to Nippon Kara Konnichiwa. That's what you should do. I, I definitely do not disagree with that one bit. <laughs> That's right. So yeah. let me ask you, what led you into metal singing versus other styles? Well, I've been a metal head since I was a teenager, you see. So uh, yeah, I love heavy metal. So when I was a teenager, um, you know, got bullied a lot, like a lot of us. And heavy metal was one of the few things that kind of made me feel um, powerful and in any way empowered, you know? I found that the, you know, the type guitars and also the vocals would kind of charge me up and they helped me feel um, strong in a world which I felt continually just wanted to beat me down. Heavy metal and martial arts, those are the two things that made me feel any sense of power and self-control in the world. So I was into heavy metal um, from a young age, always wanted to be a heavy metal singer, had the problem that uh, when I was younger, I was not able to scream. So I kind of said, well, that career is not an option then. So I went to be an actor because I liked that too. Uh, but then interestingly, being an actor taught me how to scream because one of my jobs in Hong Kong was I would dub anime into English. And so it was through dubbing monsters and things like that and like gruff growly type characters. That's actually what taught me to scream without hurting myself. Um, yeah, I spent about eight years in my bedroom going, no, that hurts, Ugh, no, that hurts. No, that hurts. Trying to figure it out, never could. So, but then once I dubbed anime, it was very interesting actually. It was something about having the the image to work off. Having the image to work off meant I could just kind of relax and I could scream naturally and I didn't hurt myself. And I was like, oh, well, here we are. So as soon as I had the ability to scream, I went out and joined bands and whatnot straight away. And uh, then ended up starting my own project. So what led you to starting Baby Beard specifically? Um, so, okay, so when I when I first started, I sung in a few different bands and so forth. Then I started singing as Lady Beard. So I started in pro wrestling with Lady Beard. Then I wanted to do this heavy metal project in which what I did, like I say, I was living in Hong Kong at the time. Um, and I had this project when I wanted to sing heavy metal covers of Cantonese pop songs. Because, yeah, because heavy metal covers of pop songs are my favorite songs. 
Like, um, I'm not sure if you've heard any of these, Gaurav, but if you go in your, you know, on the inter on the interwebs, you can look up, um, you can look up, you know, there's things like heavy metal covers of like Last Friday Night by Katy Perry and songs like this, and they're pop songs. So the way they're structured are designed to be pop songs so they get stuck in your head and they're very catchy and so forth. But then the delivery is a heavy metal delivery. And that's kind of from an emotional perspective, that's what kind of gets me powered and then charged up, right? So therefore, to me, they were always my favorite kind of songs. Um, back in like 1999, going a long way back, Limp Biscuit did a cover of Faith by George Michael, this new mud, new metal cover of Faith by George Michael. So you can uh, you can go and listen to that. That was kind of the one of the original heavy metal covers of a pop song that kind of got into the mainstream and it was wonderful. Um, and it sort of became a genre on its own. But when I got to Hong Kong, I was like, I went and I started listening to Cantonese pop songs to work on my language skills. And I said, these are really catchy, interesting pop songs. I want to hear the heavy metal covers of them. And it turned out no one had done them. So I said, yeah, yeah. When I first got there, I was like, well, someone should do that. And a few years later, I was like, I think that someone is going to be me. So I made the decision to do it. Just starting trends everywhere. <laughs> well, you know, I, like, I, I was kind of a case of, I said, I think these songs should exist in the world and no one else has done it. And um, now that I can scream, I want to be a heavy metal screamer. Specifically, those are the songs that I want to hear. If those are the songs I want to hear and I want to sing, then I'm going to sing those songs. So I started out doing heavy metal covers of Cantonese pop songs. And then I started touring like to Mandarin speaking areas in the region. So I just did Mandarin pop songs. When I came to Japan for my first tour, I learned a bunch of Japanese pop songs. I couldn't speak Japanese at the time. I just learned them songs phonetically. I did heavy metal covers of Japanese pop songs and um, that went extremely well on my first tour. So that's how we got here. Um, yeah, and then when I moved over, sorry to interrupt to, to finish the story. All the Lady Beard stories are long stories. Hey, 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 listen, a lot of things happen when you're a cross-dressing pro wrestler. A lot of things happen. Many things must be explained. Um, when I got to Japan, I got put into these pop groups with these um, young teenage girls, you see, and uh, they really popped on the internet and so forth. Um, the first song I ever did was called Nippon Manju. You can go and watch that if you want to. That went very, very well. And so um, more of that. It's uh, the world has made it clear. That's what they want from Lady Beard. Lady Beard screaming and dancing alongside two little Japanese cuties singing and dancing. That's what the world wants from me. So that's what we're giving the world. Baby Beard, Nippon Kara Konnichiwa, coming at you right now. <laughs> well, that was a great kind of walkthrough of your history because I never realized all that. That's really interesting because when you bring it up too, it's like now that I think about it, I've actually heard some metal covers of some K-pop songs such as Fake Love by uh. BTS. And I loved it, honestly. There's something about that version that specifically that was just like, wow, the, the intensity of it just felt so great to listen to. It really gets you kind of the juices pumping, you know? I haven't heard that particular cover, but now that you've told me about it, I'll go and find it. I haven't, that sounds great. Um, yeah, and exactly, it's wicked. Because the songs, as I said before, the songs are structured to be catchy pop songs. They get stuck in your head, so their structure is fantastic. But then when you throw in the metal delivery, everything's so powerful and it's so energetic that you're like, yeah, 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 come on. So with those two forces combined, it's a perfect storm of beauty. Hey, now listen, I actually have a question for you, Gaurav. So now I was watching one of your other videos and if you're not yet subscribed to The Differential Doctor, you should head over and hit subscribe right now. I was watching one of your other videos and you were reacting to various K-pop songs, yeah? And okay, so in the one I was watching, I'm sorry, I don't know his name. You were reacting with someone else, one of your guests, um, black gentleman, has a beard, was wearing, I think, a yellow beanie at the time. I believe that's Felix. Is? Okay, so you're acting with uh, Felix and you had just watched, um, I think it was BTS and Steve Aoki, that yeah. song. Mic drop. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much. You, you were reacting to mic drop and Felix said something which I didn't, um, understand and I wanted to ask about Felix said this sentence he said talking about the video he said I'm from New York and this was not woo but I still liked it and I said to myself what is 
Woo. What is this New York woo of which you speak, sir? Um, I've never heard the word woo applied to a song and whether or not a song is or is not woo before. So um, I'm sure there are all the people in New York who are sitting here going, ah, oh, you don't know woo? I know woo woo when you talk about hippie type things and healing crystals and stuff. I know woo woo, but I don't know woo. So I wanted to ask, what is woo? <laughs> so if you Felix can answer what is woo for Ladybeard, I'll be thrilled. Yeah, I'll make sure to hit up Felix as soon as I see him next time and I'll get an answer for you. I'll try to post it either on YouTube, maybe on TikTok. So everyone be on the lookout for that answer. Yes. Yes, he potentially doesn't even know he said it. It was probably just like a onomatopoeia noise he made, you know? It's probably, maybe there is no New York woo. Is there New York woo? We could start, we could start a whole um, like conspiracy theory website surrounding New York woo. And actually what happened is uh, underneath the streets of New York, um, back in the 1600s, they dug a series of tunnels, which were collectively referred to as woos by the uh, local population at the time, which could connect the islands and the suburbs. I don't know that much about New York, so going here in this improvisation right now is slightly a struggle. Uh, Felix, tell me the meaning of woo, please. Thank you, sir. I don't know. I like that uh, little theory you have there, though. <laughs> that sounds legit. Like that, I mean, yeah. What is New York woo? It's a conspiracy theory will begin. I've heard of New York pizza. I've heard of New York hardcore. I've never heard of New York Woo until Felix opened my eyes to the great conspiracy of New York Woo. Man, you're going to be stuck on this for a while now. I can tell you're oh, just, it's God. ever going to come York out of your Woo. head until you get an answer. It's just going to be haunting gonna, your dreams. I'm going to get a tattoo. What is New York Woo? It's like <laughs> I see it every day. Oh, yeah. yeah that's what's going to happen. So let me ask you real quick, just about Baby Beard. How did you find the yes. two other members? Uh, we did an audition. So, um, so yeah, so I was in this other group, which is the same formation back in 2015, 16, and that went extremely well, um, but then that kind of stopped. And so I've kind of, you know, but, but, but I, so normally I travel around the world performing at anime conventions, right? And so everyone I meet all over the world for the past five years has said, we really liked what you were doing with the two girls. We want more of that. So we're like, all right, let's do more of that um lots of moving parts to make that happen because there's a lot of behind the scenes that needs to happen on this end but we got those organized and we're like cool so we held a and actually a worldwide audition anyone anywhere in the world could audition to be in the script yeah, yeah yeah now you know there was the catch that you had to be able to if you made it past the first just send your submission you had to be able to physically get to tokyo for the second round of the audition so that eliminated some some candidates especially in times of pandemic that'll make it hard and so um, unfortunate unfortunate um <laughs> unfortunate um but so now we held an audition it was a worldwide audition and we went from like uh you, i can't even remember how many people wrote in worldwide many many worldwide so we had something like 40 or 50 or something in the first physical audition then that broke down to 20 then that broke down to five or something and then in the end these two are the chosen ones so we have we have let me tell you about the other members of my group we have uh we have a scissor who is uh, delightful. Suzu has the biggest smile that the world has ever seen. She's a lovely young lady. And very interestingly, she's never done, she's never been on stage or on camera in any capacity before, apart from like just, you know, taking selfies and so forth. Um, she's amazing actually, for someone who's never done anything like this, she's killing it. She's so calm. The first time I was on stage, I was like, ah, I was a nervous wreck. She's fantastic. She's like, ah, here we go. So we have Suzu, who's wonderful. And we have Kotomi. Kotomi is fantastic. She's very cute and adorable. She's a wonderful dancer. That's why she was cast. Her dancing skills are very, very good. You can go down to her tiki toki and watch her dance more because she dances non-stop whenever we're at work as soon as we finish something and there's a break she'll like set up her camera and start doing like tiktok dances she does all the k-pop dances she puts them on tiktok um what's kotomi's tiktok handle uh, kotomi, hinata. kotomi hinata is there an underscore kotomi underscore hinata that's K-O-T-O-M-I underscore H-I-N-A-T-A. -A. Kotomi Hinata. You can go there on the Tiki Toki. Uh, wrong. wrong. 
<laughs> what, what, what's the obvious TikTok? Uh, 2010 fans of Tommy's TikTok handle is 2010. One more time, please. 10. 10. Dot double zero. 2010 dot 10. 10. No. 2010 10 dot double zero. double zero. As you can see, she made it really easy to find her. So you can go down there and watch Kotomi dance. And Susan's TikTok and things is what? S Z eight B B. God, they made them different. <sighs> Hey, the group one is babybeard underscore Japan. Now that's easier to find. Head on down to social media and put in babybeard, as in babies plus ladybeard, babybeard underscore Japan. A press like, press subscribe, press follow, and don't forget our music video, the Nippon Kara Konnichiwa, coming at you right now. Wow, that was the most unprepared PR spiel the world's ever seen, wasn't it? What's her thing to wait? What the what? No, wrong. What? In case you people were wondering if this is scripted, it definitely is not. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> For those of you who do Lady, want to check out the TikTok stuff. Oh, <laughs> but if you do want to check out the TikToks, I will include links in the description below. Probably be a little easier yeah. than typing that out. <laughs> um, Gorab, you're on the Tiki Toki, yeah? Kinda, yeah. Are you dancing on the tiki toki? Definitely not. I have no rhythm. Is that is that the right? Uh, yeah. Pretty sure everyone watching right now wants to see the Gorav cover of Nippon Gara Konnichiwa. The Gorav dance cover of Nippon Gara Konnichiwa. The medical students dance. Nippon Gara Konnichiwa by the differential doctor and associates. That will be interesting mostly because I can barely walk without tripping over myself. But hey, if I enough people want it. Sir, <laughs> hey, if you can handle nine credit hours of plant science, you can handle a dance cover of Nippon Gara Konnichiwa by Baby Beard. Yes, yes. Look out for it, people. Coming to the Differential Doctors TikTok very soon. I mean, I will definitely take a crack at it. Once I get the chance, I uh, got board exams coming up. So, you know, maybe right after, uh, way to de-stress after, you know, celebrate with a little bit of dancing. <laughs> You've got, hang on. You've gone from shelf exam to board exam. It's, look, it's all in the name, board. My goodness. It's, you have nothing but exams. Actually, that's the life of medicine, isn't it? It's just constant yeah. exams. One of my uh, best mates from high school was a doctor. Oh, really? And his wife is also a doctor. And he, he's... He still has exams. We've been out of school for 20 years and he's like, oh, I've got an exam to do. I'm like, what? What are you talking about? We're done with that. Not me. I'm like, okay. Yeah. I have a lot of exams. Yeah, I mean, my board exam, it's supposed to be, a, if I remember correctly, it's like eight and a half hours in a day that you have to take the exam. Uh, and most people are trying to just finish it within the time limit too, so. <laughs> oh my, hang on. Wait, you're doing... <sighs> You do an exam that lasts eight and a half hours? What kind of torturous, it's like you're being in the CIA <laughs> and they're training you for in case you get kidnapped or something. What is this? It's, it's a test or stem, I guess. I mean, heck, if you can I handle guess. that, you can handle an eight hour surgery, I guess. <laughs> Listen, uh, I guess so. Listen, this is why you are in a, um, a smart person's job. This is why you are not the one with the pigtails and the skirt, my friend. You've done very well, sir. Lady Beard cannot handle an eight hour long board exam, especially since I don't know what a board exam is. It's it's bad. It's it's just brutal. <laughs> Sounds brutal, my God. So how do you feel Baby Beard is different from your older groups? Well, the older groups were kind of, they were quite Japan centric. So they were kind of built for, uh, for Japan, and whilst we did some overseas stuff, it was really Japan this year, and we were kind of focused on Japan, and that's kind of how that went. Uh, with Baby Beard, we're really from day one, we're trying to create a global group. See, so 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 we are hoping to now listen. Pandemics are not wonderful things for global groups. <laughs> so so the plan is the plan is to bring the live show to as many people around the world as we possibly can. That was the plan until this interesting world event 
took hold, um, but that still is the plan. So listen, the plan from day one was to get the show out to as many people all over the world as, as we possibly can. Um, I, as an individual, I've traveled all over the world for the past um, six years or something doing performances and so forth. And everyone, like I say, everyone wants to see this show. They want Lady Beard and the two cute girls. So we're like, cool, let's give the world that. So we got it all organized, we put it together. And then the world said, you can't, <laughs> you can't get on an airplane. So, so now the meaning of Nippon Kara Konnichiwa is hello from Japan. So what we're doing is in this very unique global environment when we can't physically come and see anyone, we are sitting here and we are screaming a huge Konnichiwa from the land of the rising sun through the internet at you, at you, dear friend, wherever you may be, where you may be, be you in Tennessee, be you in Timbuktu, be you in Mombasa, or Vladivostok, or all the way out in Vindhurk, we are screaming to you, Konnichiwa, through the internet, through the Pongara, Konnichiwa. It's a globally centric group. Uh, between the members of the group, we have how many languages spoken total? Six? Six languages, yeah? Six, something like that. There's a lot of languages going on. Um, it's, you know, it's a Japanese group, but we're trying to get it to the world as much as we possibly can. So I'd say that's probably the biggest difference. The global factor, the global viewpoint, the global lens. Hey, hey, everyone loves something global. Sure, check me that globe, please. Check me that globe, please. Let me tell you something. Hey, the globe, look how extensive the globe is. A lot of things happen in the globe. There's many a place in the globe, even Antarctica. We're coming to Antarctica, the whole flipping globe, people. Lady Beard, the Pongara Konnichiwa, coming at you. Thanks. <laughs> it's surprising that you had a globe ready for that, but I love it. We have like 10 globes in this office. I don't know, why do we have so many globes? People give the boss globes for some reason. Why do we have so many globes? Here's another different globe. Here's yet another globe. Here's another They're globe. trying to remind you we you're international. Spain. We are, that's exactly right. Maybe I'll leave this globe right here. I'll leave it uh, since um, you're in the United States. I'll leave it on the United States. There we are. Next is another globe. We have so many globes. We have a whole connection of globes. I'll leave this one on Africa. There we go. Here's another globe. Look how many globes we have. Why do we have this many globes in the office? I don't know why we have this many globes. And we have another, oh, here's a small globe. Here's just a tiny, teeny, tiny little globe. There we go. As you can see, it's uh, we're globe centric here. I'll move the camera down so you can see all the globes. Look at all the globes. Look at the lady, look at all these globes. Clearly baby beard is a global group illustrated by this abundance of globes. No other pop group in history has had quite as many globes. We are all about Globes. We got more globes. She's we got, we got so many globes. Look at these globes. I gotta handle as many globes. Oi, hey, listen. I'm sure there's something involved the tunnels underneath New York with these globes. I'm sure somehow the New York. Oh, these ones are magnetic. Oh, these globes are magnetic. Look at that. Oh, wow. Oh, that is badass, actually. I didn't know these ones were magnetic. Oh, wow. Well, look, Lady Beard's found a game for after this interview finishes, hasn't he? Hey! <laughs> New York Woo! Mm. What's what's going on, Borov? How are you? <laughs> that was, uh, I, I love the number of globes. It's to remind you of all the places you're about to go tour. I mean... <laughs> of all the places we, we, uh, we hope to go to tour. Exactly, all the places we will go to tour. Baby Beard is coming at you. No matter where you are, whether you're in the African continent, whether you're in uh, the Americas, North America, or South America, or Central America, wherever you may be, all the way here down in Australasia, all the way here in the Asian region. Hey, Baby Beard is coming at you. 2022, ladies and gentlemen, and other friends, hook it up. Ah! That was, that was great. <laughs> <laughs> this is some, this is some, this is, we are doing some things over here. We, look, the globes have never been involved in an interview before. This is fantastic. Maybe these globes could be made into some kind of earring situation. These globes are a whole new, whole new things. Global earrings. Oh, those those look amazing. Not gonna lie. They look nice. They're yeah. good. Yeah, I like it. We should make some globe hair accessories. Stick them up the top there. Yes, yes. Globalization. Yes. Whoa! Just let me drink with a straw one more time. Oh, I'm naked. 
all this worldwide activity has got me exhausted, eh? Mm. So, do you feel like you have more control over the group Baby Beard, like more creative control? Yeah, definitely. Um, that's one of the great things about um, this is kind of from day one, when we put it together, we worked with the boss of our, um, our management company. We're like, okay, cool. Here's what we think we should do. Um, the boss does not have nearly as much overseas experience as me and my uh, manager do. So to that end, a lot of the overseas stuff, he's like, you guys understand that better than I do. So please, what do you reckon we should do? So actually he's been fantastic in that regard. It's wonderful. That's great to hear. I mean, I think it's very important for the artists to have a lot of control over their group because it kind of separates you from like just every other group out there that's just, you know, pumping out music just to pump out music. Um, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's ideal. If you're in rock and roll, it's a, this one keeps moving and frankly, it's freaking me out a little bit. I'm going to move that globe. If you're in rock and roll, that's kind of what it always has been because rock and roll bands are like yeah man just do things my way and so that's it's a strange thing because because putting like metal and pop music together heavy metal is and rock music in general it's all from it's all ground up like it's all you and your filthy friends get some instruments so you learn to play them badly and then you make a terrible band and then you print some awful t-shirts and then you figure out some haphazard to it and so it's all Kind of organically from ground up whereas pop music is normally it's for it's like it's a bottom down construction there's a company that says we make pop songs and pop groups so we're gonna find people and we're gonna train them and then put them into a group so it's all bottom down so these two things coming together um is um is well i think it's 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 an intersection of worlds isn't it it's an intersection of worlds and it's a, uh, a diagram in which I'm blocking a huge source of light on my face. To that end, let's switch it this way. It's an intersection of worlds, as you can see. Um, so normally from the pop model, normally the artist doesn't have any control at all. You get told what the hell to do and you like it or you lump it. Um, but then from a rock and roll perspective, it's you and the guys in your band. If anyone tells you what to do, they're like, no, nah, man, bleh, bleh, bleh. you know, so, so, so it's an interesting marriage. Definitely. I, I definitely like how you kind of elaborate on that, too, because I think that'll definitely paint a good picture for a lot of viewers, because honestly, when you say it like that, that really does kind of explain why personally I've noticed um, when I react to like Korean rock music as well, I feel a little bit more different about the lyrics specifically than certain pop songs. And the way you just described it, that that kind of explains why that makes a lot of sense now. Hang on. Tell me more. The, the lyrics of Korean rock. Yeah. as opposed to Korean pop. Not necessarily Korean pop. Um, I feel like at least for Korean pop, they definitely have more control over their own lyrics and their music. Um, for example, uh, Seventeen, if I remember correctly, they're, they go by the fact that they are like a self-producing group. You know, they, they uh -huh. pretty much control everything. So I, I compare it more so to American pop because I don't listen to as much American rock. Um, that's why I couldn't really make that connection. But Korean rock compared to like American pop, I can definitely see more of that Korean rock, even though I don't understand the language. I just I can feel more out of it just from listening to it. And then, you know, on my channel, I like to look at lyrics, too. And I can when I read those lyrics, I just feel more as well. But that's more of a me thing. I'm sure others feel differently. You know, that's the beauty of music. Everyone feels a different way from so you feel that rock and I'm moving these globes. So these globes are distracting. I'm moving these freaking globes. Now there's there everywhere and I can't get rid of them. <sighs> now there's blocking the light, freaking globes. Sorry, hang on. Oh God, now I've broken the globes. Um, so you think you feel, you feel that more of an emotional, more of an emotional message from rock and roll lyrics as opposed to pop lyrics? That... Yeah, I, I think, Definitely emotionally. Um, there's definitely been songs that like have brought me to tears before just listening to it because I feel like I can actually relate to this. I it feels like <sighs> there's this one person who's come on my channel before um, who specifically told me about his experience with a K-pop group named Stray Kids and how like some of their songs, you know, it's just to, it feels like their songs are written specifically to him. Just the way that's written, it just sounds like it's written for him and others like him, and it just means so much to him and i get the oh, same wow. feeling from a lot of k-pop and k-rock that i don't really get necessarily from american pop sometimes hmm. okay that's interesting 
You know, I've never heard someone um, give that review, actually. That is very interesting. Do you listen to Bollywood music? Oh, I listen to a ton of Bollywood. I, it's weird. Really? So I can understand Hindi if someone's speaking it, but when it's in Bollywood, if it's a movie or a song, for some reason, I can't understand. I don't know if it's just okay. too fast for me or maybe no, it's I just... Understand. It's yeah. because of the way that it's delivered and the way it's yeah. structured and so forth. Because it's poetic. It's not conversation anymore. Yeah. It's poetic. And it's a, a lot of words that, you know, my mom isn't using around the house. <laughs> so, you know, it's uh, definitely definitely a bit of a disconnect on that. But it's I think especially nowadays, I've grown to want to support more Asian artists, but also mostly like Indian artists, um, especially Indian artists in America, because I've noticed like some of them are such amazing artists and they don't get any recognition. Um, they either it's because they don't know how to kind of build their career in America or it's just because of who they are in their race. So um, personally, like, you know, I might not be much, but I like to support them however I can. Like when I'm driving, it's all Asian music um, cool. blasting throughout. If someone's in the car with me and doesn't understand too bad for them, they're going to have to listen to it with me. Um, luckily, none of my friends complain. Um, I think that's one of the beauties. And I know this might sound strange, but one of the beauties of medical school, especially my medical school, I feel like the students there really are open and really understanding and like to learn about one another's cultures. Like some of the most meaningful conversations about culture I've had are with my classmates who I don't know anything about their culture. They don't know anything about mine, but we just connect because it's just that shared experience within our own cultures that we just appreciate so much. No, that's beautiful. That's a, that's a lovely thing. That's wonderful. Um, have you listened to very, here's a question. Have you gotten up into any of the Indian rock music? I've listened to some. So the issue with, and you know, issue for me, not necessarily for others, is Indian music within India is more so made for movies. And it's, you know, the movie industry controls kind of the music industry. So rock, if from what I've seen so far, and you know, I don't really know how to look up popular rock artists in India necessarily, but um, what I've seen is usually more independent people just uploading to YouTube. And so it's really hard to find them. Um, but when I do hear it, I just, I do like it. Again, issue is that some of them, since they are small, they don't have like lyrics in English. So it can be a little hard for me to know what exactly they're saying. I've had my parents translate for me though in the past, wow. which is a little awkward because even they like have trouble like translating it from Hindi to English and then I get confused and it's, it, anyways, that's a whole nother thing. <laughs> <laughs> I was a uh, I was a big fan of the, an Indian metalcore band. I don't know if they're still active or not. Um, but I was a big fan of this band. Hey, I'll give them a shout out. I was a fan of this band called Bayanok Moth. I uh, never believe heard that's pronunciation. B a Bayanok B a y a n a u k Bayanok Moth M a u t. If yeah. you say so. <laughs> they were a metalcore band in India. They were active about ten years ago, and actually, I'm not sure if they still are. But it was funny, right? Because I, um, back when I was in Hong Kong, I, uh, I liked this band and I liked their Facebook and so forth. And then um, randomly one night, I think it was Halloween in Hong Kong, I'm out partying and one of the guys from Bionok Mott walks past. He was easy to recognize, he had this huge beard. And I'm like, you're from Bionok Mott. And we had a beautiful moment, it was fantastic. Especially since he wasn't even Indian India, he was in Hong Kong, just on holiday or whatever. That's so, so random. Yeah. Like <laughs> it was the most random thing ever. It was amazing, actually. Shout out to Bionok Mott. You guys are amazing. <laughs> I'm definitely gonna have to check out some of their music after this because I'm definitely interested yeah, yeah, in checking yeah. that out. Yeah, great. They were awesome. So why did you choose Nipponkar Konichiwa to be your debut song? I know you talked about how it's kind of like a message to everyone. Is that your main goal for that song, or was there another reason why it was your debut song? Well, it's the debut song because that is the message. So, so Baby Beard really has two missions. Number one, just spread some good vibes and some happiness because frankly, I think all of us could use some of that after the past two years we've all had. Some of that, and also to kind of get um, Japanese pop culture out to the world. Um, there's such a rich kind of underground pop culture in Japan, which is really colorful, really joyous, really wonderful. And there's a huge hunger for it that I see overseas. But getting, if you're not in Japan and you can't read and speak Japanese, getting access to it is extremely difficult. So that one of the things we're trying to do is somewhat bridge that gap as much as we can with Baby Beard. That's why Nippon Karako Ninjua 
is the debut single because it's out of ah, from Japan ah, to the world type thing. All right, so what do you have in stores next for fans? Oh my God. So after you've gone and watched Nippon Kara Konnichiwa by Baby Beard, that's Baby Beard underscore Japan, Nippon Kara Konnichiwa. After you've watched that video several times, you will be chomping at the bit to hear our second song, Pianizer, which comes to the YouTubes in February. February number what? February! It's coming to the YouTubes in February, people! You need to keep your eye on it. Let me explain. Um, Pianizer is based on uh, the Japanese word pian, which is thrown around by uh, the, the, the teenagers nowadays. Pian is that emoji with the big eyes that looks like it's going to cry. That's called pian in Japanese. So pian is used to express... Um, pian is used to express a moment of mild sadness so for instance for instance if you do the washing and then you hang it up on the clothesline and you go inside and then it rains ah oh, pian it's not the end of the world but it's not convenient that's a that's a pian moment and pianizer is a whole song about that we took an emoji and we made a song, people. It's a song from an emoji. When have you felt pian recently? Maybe you were studying for your shelf exam and <laughs> some water got spilt on your notes. Maybe, Gorab, what's a recent pian moment that you've had? Oh my gosh. Honestly, I can't even think of one off the top of my head. Maybe, maybe you were doing an interview and you were interfered with by an abundance of globes. And then one of the globes, this one just keeps, it just, oh, now it's broken in half. Oh God, look. It's... Time for that emoji to show up. <laughs> hey. Babybeard, Nippon Gara Konnichiwa and Pianizer coming to YouTube soon. So past, <laughs> so past Pianizer as well, what do you see as for the future of Babybeard? Well, we just want, I got to tell you, man, we just want to get overseas and get on stages overseas. That's kind of really, we want to get on with it and do that. Um, uh, yeah, like that's, uh, really want to get on with it. Um, really want to get on with it on stage in all the countries, in all the places of the globe. I'm leaving the globes out of camera because we've had enough. But every nation of the globe is where Baby Beard is coming for the live performance. When Baby Beard comes to your town at an anime convention or perhaps in some other capacity, come on down and see us. We would love to sing a dance for you and then afterwards take a picture. That sounds great. I can't wait for this pandemic to kind of calm down a bit and see right. like what you can do when you literally go all over this world because I feel like you know, the pandemic is limiting you, but at the same time, it can be kind of a form of inspiration because I feel like your first music video, and for those who haven't seen it yet, pause, go watch. Um, you know, because I don't want to spoil anything here, but I feel like the music video kind of reminded me of like, hey, we're in a pandemic now. So like, we kind of have to, in a way, limit ourselves because obviously you can't do a ton of scenes outside with a bunch of people and, you know, it's it's just not going to work um, in this current pandemic. So considering that like you really just made that music video perfect and beautiful and like really got the message through that you wanted to get through and the visuals really do capture that and i honestly i i, I applaud you for that because that's really hard to do when you have when you're limited by so much thanks dude i appreciate that when we were shooting it yeah it's, it's an interesting thing when we were actually shooting it the three of us as the three members we didn't really know what was going to happen. Was there with the director? Because the whole thing's on green screen, right? Because it was like we couldn't, at the time, we couldn't go outside and shoot. So our only option was to shoot this whole thing on a green screen. So, all right, cool. So we're there on our green screen. He's like, okay, cool. Dance, cut. And then after that, okay, cool. Sing and cut. Okay, cool. And they were like, so what's going to happen on the green behind us? And he's like, well, you'll have to wait and find out. <laughs> like, okay. Okay, so, so then it came back and it's all the things in the, in the video. Um, yeah, should I go for spoilers? Should I assume people have seen it already? Warning, if you have not seen the music video, this is your last chance to pause and go watch Last the time. music video. And now. So we get, we get the final edit back and it's me popping out of spaghetti and all this kind of thing. What the, what the hell happened? When, as the 
members of the group, we had no idea that's what was in store for us. The director's like, ah, <laughs> just new way. My God. So it came back. We actually, we shot a reaction video of the girls watching it for the first time. And the whole, they're just losing their minds for the whole thing. It's just like four minutes of constant giggle. So, so, oh, so by this day, if you've made it this far in the interview, I assume you've seen the video. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, no, that whole thing, we were like, anything could happen. I, I can definitely imagine just, so one thing that if some of you who have seen some of my reactions with my guests is that I think an issue medical students have is we overanalyze. So when we're like reacting to something, we're literally just like looking so intensely that sometimes our face is not reacting. And you do look intensely. I have noticed that watching your videos, there's three kind of right faces <laughs> whilst you watch the video. And I think people assume like we don't like what we're watching, but it's honestly like we like it so much that we're trying to analyze every little bit that we can. Like if we didn't like it, it we really would our faces would probably show more like disgust than anything but like when we really like something especially i think it's just again that medical student like mindset is like we have to analyze every little thing because you know this has a meaning connected to that and that has a meaning connected to this oh and that comes back like two minutes later in the music video oh okay i'm starting to piece these together you know it's just it's just one of those oh, things man. and yeah i know i i know i have that issue it's like my face just kind of goes like into study mode pretty much <laughs> I appreciate you being so attentive. Um, most pe most people are like, Wah! so I appreciate your your expert attention to detail, sir. I mean, hey, I've got to I got to analyze as best as I can because I mean I'm gonna be doing the same thing with patients. I can't be laughing at a patient while they're telling the story. So, <laughs> but you're telling me you're telling me your face would show disgust if you did not like the video. Yeah. yeah, so it's so, like... I mean, if someone comes into the emergency room with like a big bloody hole in their arm, you're going to be like, oh, God, oh, oh, get it away. Oh, no. Oh, no, no don't worry about that. That uh, I've gotten desensitized to that at this, at this point. I think... Uh, oh, really? <laughs> at this point, oh, I think uh, more so disgust as far as if there's something in a music video that I just think is wrong or it's just, eh, it's okay. Like, you're going to notice it more on my face rather than like... You know, like when I just love a song, it I really won't show any emotion. Maybe like on the second time th through or like third time through, I might show more emotion because at that point I've analyzed everything I can. Like, you know, at this point I can just enjoy the song. You're a tough audience, sir. You're a tough audience. Oh my God. I also can't be uh, swinging around with the music too much because, you know, if I'm listening to music while I'm like waiting for a patient to come through, you know, I, they got to assume the doctor's standing there. You know, he's doing something important, not listening to music, you know, so... Hey, uh, this is the music, the very important thing. True. Hey, hey, how else are you going to make it to the end of your eight hour long <laughs> surgery if you don't have a little bit of inspiration, Goram? You're going to keep the energy flowing. I will admit, surgeons, they, they play some really good music during surgeries. Like, it's just constant blasting music really? everywhere. Yeah. I imagine, I imagine it's like 80s rock, nonstop. Rock and rock! Rock and rock! Always cutting through the arteries and things. That's There's some imagine. that do that. There, so I've been with a ton of surgeons now. Uh, one of them, so let's see, a gastroenterologist I was with, he plays metal. Like he plays pure metal throughout. Mm. Same with a uh, ophthalmologist I was with, just pure metal throughout. And then Good. we've got some that are more old school, some that play like just whatever's you know popular right now, just because the nurses get on their case. Otherwise, you know, it's just <laughs> just whatever uh, whatever flows. Wow. So who has final say? Does the doctor have control over the music? Oh, no, it's, in always the, the uh, it's always the nurses. It's always the nurses. The nurses. Yeah, because you got to treat the them right. Because power in numbers. The, the nurses are the ones who are keeping everything afloat. The doctors are just there to be robots, really. Like we just do as we're as we need to. But these nurses, like, oh my gosh, you won't believe how many times nurses have really just saved me for like when I'm going to a new rotation site, and I'm just like, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know where I'm going. And if you're nice to the nurses, they will just help you out and they'll give you like warnings like, oh, this doctor, you know, he's a little crabby today. So, you know, make sure you tone it back, make sure you don't like piss them off. You know, they'll they'll give you those heads up and they are <laughs> people don't appreciate wow, nurses the enough. The importance of nurses. How about this? Yeah. Hey, listen, hey, the differential doctor and Lady Beard both support nurses. All right. Good yeah, job. be kind to your nurses, especially during this pandemic. I, you know, my girlfriend's a nurse, and 
they they have to go through a lot like they deal with a lot of stuff throughout the hospital so you know definitely appreciate your nurses next time you see one you know just saying be nice to the nurses be nice to your nurses. make a meme be <laughs> nice to the nurses let's pose for a meme so if you hadn't done music what do you think you'd be doing with your life right now oh wow here's a question if i were not doing music what would I be doing with my life right now? Probably cowering in a corner, quivering, um, talking to myself and mumbling and bambling. Bambling's not a word, but rambling. That's the word, rambling to anyone who would listen about uh, my conspiracy theory regarding the woo of New York. Hey, listen, hey, the woo underneath New York. Listen, hey, 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 they're coming. They're coming, and we need to prepare ourselves for the great real ruining. The world's gonna get you if you don't pre-prepare yourself for the world. That's what I'd be doing. Ah, of course, no, just like any other person. Right, exactly. Yeah. So uh, what was your most memorable moment with a fan? <laughs> so, um, uh, I am so right after I got uh, famous in Japan, um, I won't, I went overseas. I won't say where, uh, to a particular Asian place. I went overseas and, um, I did the show and, uh, it was afterwards we're taking photos and so forth with the fan and this, this tiny little woman, she comes up to me and very sweet, very soft spoken, lovely. And she says, Lady Beard, can I please make a request? And I'm like, oh, sure, sweetheart. What is it thinking it's going to be? She wants me to hug her or pick her up for a photo or something lovely of this. She goes, can you please headbutt me? And I'm like, what? <laughs> she goes, can you please headbutt me? I'm like, wait, wait, you want me to do what? So just FYI, a pro wrestling headbutt in pro wrestling, when you headbutt someone, you take this part of your skull and you crack it as hard as you can into the same point as someone else's skull, right? And it's... Uh, and the recipient will literally see stars if you do a good job of it, right? The first time I took a, a proper one, I literally saw stars. I've never seen stars before, and I did. Um, I'm sure there's a medical name for seeing stars, but we don't need to go into that right now. Look, this tiny little woman, she wants me to headbutt her. And I look at my manager and I'm like, she wants me to headbutt her. Will we get sued? And she's like, well, she's asking for it. Everyone can see her asking for it. I think it'll be fine. I'll make you sure. You want me to headbutt you, are you sure? She's like, yeah, please headbutt me. I'm like, Okay, so grab her head and very gently, I'm like, <coughs> and she goes, oh, that wasn't a head, but do it properly. I'm like, oh, okay. <clears throat> and I nail her. She's like, oh, 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 thanks. I posed for a photo. So <laughs> that was my most memorable fan moment. I mean, that's got to be definitely memorable for her if she remembers it <laughs> after that head but remembers it should be seen hopefully she saw some stars if she didn't see stars i didn't do a good job so i go damn i mean that's that's probably why she wanted the photo after she you know that way when she forgets she'll be like oh yeah, actually the moment. yeah she was fantastic god bless her Mwah. thank you sweetheart i love you so what are some of your favorite things to do around japan oh favorite things to do well i like riding my bicycle um, yeah, so, 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 so I had not really ridden a bicycle since I was like, you know, 12 years old or something at home. Um, uh, but, uh, yeah, in Tokyo, everyone rides bikes. So when I first got here, it was like, you know, people are like, oh, you know, gotta get a bike. That's the way to get around. And I'm like, oh, okay. So I got a bicycle and now I am reawakened to the joys of bicycle riding. So just, just riding your bike around Tokyo and so forth is actually wonderful. Sometimes I go out, you know, instead of going to the gym, I'll go on a long old bike ride. And that is actually one of my favorite things to do in Tokyo because they have, because the city's set up for bikes, you see. So it's set up with a lot of big wide bike paths and so forth. And also the place is particularly clean. This is one of the wonderful things about Japan. The Japanese don't litter. So the place is immaculately clean, very well kept. They're very good with their maintenance of infrastructure of things like this. So riding a bike is a really pleasant experience because it's super smooth and you I have a friend from the Ukraine and he goes, this was so funny when I first got here. 
and goes to me, Manny, I love riding. I don't know if that's a Ukrainian accent. That's how he speaks. Like, man, I love riding my bike here, you know, because at home I'm on my bike and it's like, doof, 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 doof. but here I'm on my bike and it's like I'm flying. <laughs> so cycling around Tokyo is actually a really enjoyable experience. And just recently we were down in Imabari, which is um, in the west of Japan. If you look on the map, you know, Japan kind of, I'm sure this, um, this perspective, Japan feels like that. And there's this like clump of islands around the bottom bit here. Down there is a, that's that, uh, the big island there is called Shikoku. And there's a lot of cycling that goes on around there. They have all these bridges between the islands and it's all set up for cycling. And so they have like, when you go on the highway, there'll be a huge bike lane next to it. So there's all kinds of cycling industry that happens down there. Um, so if you want to come to Japan, I would recommend you check out a cycling tour and just around Tokyo, ride your bike. That's my recommendation. It's the best. I almost, you know, I almost got a throat injury um, yesterday because I was riding my bike. It's freezing here in the winter time at the moment. I was riding my bike and I was singing Thomas the Tank Engine and I nearly got, <laughs> nearly got a vocal injury doing that. I'm on my bike going, ba, 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 out in the cold and um, it wasn't good for me. It wasn't good for me. You'd be able to medically break down exactly what was what I was doing wrong, loudly singing Thomas the Tank Engine on my bike in the cold. Whatever it was, it hurt. Yeah, Lady Beard recommends if you do cycle in Japan, feel free to sing, but sing in a volume and a range that you can handle without injury. That's what I think you should do in Japan. It's funny that you mentioned biking, uh, bicycling. Man, I can't talk now. Because um, <laughs> one of my friends, uh, also in medical school, shout out to Kamar. Um, he's Ma! really, yeah, he's always trying to start um, kind of increasing the number of bike lanes around uh, our state and our city. And, you know, he actually uses Japan as a reference. And I just thought it was interesting that you brought that up. So, yeah. There we are. Hey, good job, Kamar. Kamar's on the track. Yes, yes, hey, hey. Come on and bicycles in the city of Tennessee. That's a state, not a city. We're just going with the whole freaking state. The state of Tennessee needs more bikes. Kamar said so. And now I'm telling you, use Japan as the model. Use Kamar as the model. Get on your bicycle. Careful with your throat when you're singing Thomas the Tank Engine. It's going to be a wonderful time. Get on your bike, Tennessee. That's our new slogan. That's what we're going to use as our new slogan right there. <laughs> yes. Get on your bike, Tennessee. Yes. So one of my friends who uh, reacted with me um, mentioned that you like anime. Is that true? Yeah. So yeah, what's yeah. your favorite anime? My favorite anime is an anime called Bacano. Bacano. I actually don't know that one. It's not that well known and it's a little bit older now. It's probably it's good ten, at least 10 years ago now, but it's fantastic. You should watch it, Bacano. B-A-C-C-A-N-O, exclamation mark. You have to put the exclamation mark at the end. It's very important. Um, it's this, uh, yeah, it's a fantastic story, actually. It's kind of like a gangster crime story interwoven with this time travel monster story. So it's, ah, uh, this is the thing. It's awesome. And I don't want to try and give you any kind of summary because I'll just turn it into a mess. So go and check out Picano. That's my favorite anime. That'll and then all the cute songs, I also like my melody. Okay. Yeah, I'll definitely add it to my list because I'm always looking for some good anime to watch. Uh, uh, it's bad. Man, my favorite it's will always be Yu Yu Hakusho, though. Say what? Yu Yu Hakusho. Oh, right. Yeah. Awesome. That's always going to be my favorite. <laughs> oh, that was what got me into anime, so. <laughs> yeah? That's what got you into anime. Yeah. Do you watch a lot of anime now? I watch a lot of anime now. <laughs> like, too much. What, tell me what you're watching. What you watching? Uh, let's see. Right now, I'm watching Ranking of the Kings, or Ranking of Kings, with my girlfriend. Oh, wow. That one's... <laughs> I was surprised how good it was. I always have, like, three or four different friends who are always like, you gotta watch this. No, you gotta watch this. So, I was trying to, like, figure out which one to start next. Um, about to start the new season of Attack on Titan. I'm, I'm waiting for a oh, few more great. episodes to come out. Oh man. Oh great. But yeah, there's so many there's so much good anime to watch. Um I'm watching Seven Deadly Sins, which I know some people said gets a oh, little right. bit uh a little bit downhill later on. I've seen the first few seasons, but I was like, you know what, I'll, I'll give it a shot. You can have any opinion you want, my thing. This is my fr my friend. I called you my thing. I'm <laughs> sorry, my friend. I was about to say this is the thing about 
uh, content and consuming content. You can have any opinion you like and you can watch any content you like and nobody's stopping you. And Ladybeard supports you watching any anime that you want to watch, Gorab. Don't let these friends influence you with their opinions. You have your own opinion. You can have your own opinion. I need a second opinion. No, you don't. This is it. Gorab, watch whatever you like. All right, I'll, I'll take your word for it, man. Uh, sure. <laughs> so sure. let me ask you, if you could make an opener for any anime that you wanted, what anime would you want to make an opener for? It would be the Ladybeard anime, quite clearly. It would be Ladybeard's adventures around Japan. Here's what I imagine happening in the story. Um, actually, Ladybeard is a happy cross-dressing pro wrestler and heavy metal singer living in Tokyo. And uh, but then he, uh, what happens one day is he stumbles across a crime being committed by a group of gangsters uh, against uh, a group of innocents. And Ladybeard steps in to save the day, not reeling it, not realizing in fact that these are organized criminals. Ladybeard saves the day, beats up the gangsters in question, saves the innocents, but now, now the gang has a hit out on Ladybeard and Ladybeard needs to go on a crazy adventure on a bicycle around Japan, fighting the evil gangster lords. That, it's called, it's called Ladybeard City in Chaos. That's the name of the anime that we, Babybeard, should be making the opener for. Hey, make a note. Ladybeard City in Chaos coming to you 2023. Let's go, humans. Hey. You seem a little out of breath now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm going to need to drink from a straw one more time. Drink a different fluid. I'm gonna go, this fluid's good for after you've hurt your throat singing Thomas the Tank Engine. Here we are. Mm. It's funny that you mentioned the anime, though. Um, my friend and I were talking about that exact question because I was like, you know what? I Because as I mentioned, I could see uh, Nippon Kara Konnichiwa being like an opener for certain animes. Maybe not the lyrics necessarily, but like the beat and the just the sound of it would be perfect for almost any anime. Then the lyrics, I was like, ah, yes. oh, that could work for like a slice of life anime possibly. And then my friend's like, nah, nah, nah. He needs to make his own anime and that that yes. will be the opener. <laughs> Which friend said that? Was it come off? It was actually David. He was one of the people who reacted David. with me. So, uh, David, my boy, you're telling truths, David. You're telling truths. I'm on it. I'm on it, my friend. Bringing it to you, David. 2023. I make no guarantee, but 2023. That's what we'll attempt. I mean, hey, if you if you manage to do that, I'm gonna be the first one to watch it. That's gonna Bless be you. Thank top you. of my Thank list. You. I mean, uh, that honestly, even just the premise just sounds entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> Lady Beard on bike escaping yakuza persecution oh it's gonna be something yeah <laughs> i nearly got in a fight with the yakuza in my first year in japan mm -hmm. and that story also involves a bike but i'm not gonna tell it <laughs> that not. it might get me in trouble now <laughs> yeah we we don't want to get you in trouble just when you're starting to debut again i mean you know we gotta right exactly yeah. right as we're getting out there right as we're saying to the world now I get in gangster trouble. That'll end badly. That'll be the uh, my second anime, Ladybeard, Gangster Trouble. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know which is worse, Gangster Trouble or Legal Trouble. <laughs> Ooh, that's another <laughs> anime gangster right there. Trouble. They're two opposite extremes, aren't they? Right. They're two extremes of the same problem. You either broke the law and now you're in trouble with the law, or you, you I guess, didn't break the law. <laughs> you prevented the breaking of the law. And now you're in trouble with the mob. Dear me, I don't know how we got onto this. <laughs> hey, go on, watch Lady Beard City in Chaos. That's not a real show. <laughs> so let me ask you something. Once once this pandemic kind of calms down a bit, and you know, you're gonna be traveling a lot, you're gonna you're gonna come visit me, right? And give me some back pay of course. backstage passes, right? I mean Of course, right, man. Cool. <laughs> of course, of course. And uh in the Gorav md institution hey hey tell your university they need to book baby beard to come for a live show on campus you sir backstage pass ah side of the stage looking at the show from the side hey the whole thing my friend you are there gorab you are there gorab and gorab's mates david you're welcome come on you're welcome um um gentleman who made the new york woo What's his name? Felix. Felix. <laughs> Felix. Hey, 
You guys are all welcome at the Baby Beard Show. When we get the Baby Beard Live experience to Tennessee, let me know. And everyone else in Tennessee and surrounding areas, when we get to Tennessee and surrounding areas, we will see you there. And we look forward to partying like you've never partied before. I will definitely be holding you to that. Uh, let me go and make a quick yes. note. So, <laughs> so <laughs> probably I'm hoping to visit Japan maybe a year or two. Um, you're gonna rest. You're gonna let me wrestle you, right? Like that's gonna be part of my oh trip. Oh my god! Oh my goodness! Holy moly! This wow! You wanna wow! You wanna wrestle, lady man? Holy moly! I'm in mean, charge. I mean, well, clearly this is the third anime. It's 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 Lady Beard versus Gorav, the blood feud I didn't know I had. My God! All right, bro, wrestling, it's on. All right, it's I gotta, on. I gotta have a tag team partner. I mean, I obviously, you know, you're, you're gonna you're yeah. gonna cream me. So I think David's gonna have to come. We're both gonna just like you know be cheating a little bit, but you know we gotta do what we gotta do. That's just. I'll bring Kamal. He can his gimmick can be he rides a bike. Oh, there there you go. You both come in riding a yes. bike together. There. Yes. Uh, yes, because that way you can be like the tandem buddies or something like that. You can uh, evolve the word tandem in your tag. Yes, the tandem tag team. Ah, oh, yes, this is golden. Ah, oh, yes. We've got all our content prepared for the next few years. We're we're good. <laughs> yes. I can't wait to wrestle the tandem tag team. This is going to be fantastic. So, Lady Beard, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, sir. Before we get off, is there anything you want to tell viewers? Uh, everybody, thank you very much for tuning in uh, to Lady Beard with the Differential Doctor today. Don't forget to head to Gorav's channel, the Differential Doctor, and press subscribe and like, etc. Comments and things in the boxes and so forth. Don't forget to head to social media, babybeard underscore Japan. Also, my personal ones, ladybeard underscore Japan, and the girls' ones, too long and complicated to repeat right now. Press the likey, subscribe, the comments, the things, please. Thank you very much. And uh, everybody, keep your head up in these challenging times. Challenging times, world over right now, people. Everybody, uh, keep your head up. Lady Beard sends you infinite love from the land of the rising sun and infinite support in these challenging, challenging times. Thank you all very much for listening today. Gaurav, thank you, my friend. This has been hilarious. Thank you so much once again. And for those of you viewing, make sure you check out Nippon. Kara, konnichiwa. The link, again, description below. I'll also have the link for my reaction to it in the description below as well. Come on, you gotta show him some love. All right, see y'all yes. next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>